The world is changing rapidly. Wars and rumors of wars are abundant. Civil unrest, economic collapse, a global economic reset, natural disasters, and the second coming of Jesus Christ is on the horizon. Are you prepared? Welcome to Truth Fed. Sin never dies of itself. Never. If it's not uprooted, destroyed, it's going to take the throne. It literally takes the throne. I don't care how you sing. I don't care how you shout. If we continue in sin, the time is coming. It's going to take the throne. And we heard that very clearly this afternoon. Powerful message about the covenant and the need for God to deal with our sins. The conscience becomes defiled. Discernment is the first thing that goes. You lose your discernment. You can't tell the difference between right and wrong anymore. The difference between right and wrong becomes very clouded and fuzzy. And then that sin will become a voice in itself. And it will quote scripture to you to justify it. The devil came to Jesus and tried to justify his temptation with scriptures. Oh, I have so many people tell me, uh, tell me that... Uh, you know, this is not wrong because God spoke to me. And God told me that this was not sinful. When very clearly it's contrary to the word of God. Now under the new covenant, God made a promise to send the Holy Ghost to abide in us. To empower us to live in victory over sin. And to completely defeat the dominion of sin in our lives. There would be a release of this power, and he, he would give us a new heart, the scripture says. He would give us a new mind, and he would come to set us free from all the captivity and slavery of sin. That is the promise of the new covenant. He promised to break the chains and set every captive free. But those promises are given only to those who are sick of their sin and weary of it. Greetings, and uh, as you probably recognize, that was David Wilkerson, the late David Wilkerson. Uh, you know, to go back and, you know, to find good preached words to uh, broadcast over the show, you have to go back in time, uh, because there's not a lot of truth in the American church today, or, or the church at large. It's harder and harder to find good men who speak the truth, and... Um, you know, we talk a lot on this show about sin and how, and the lukewarm and how uh, Christians in America specifically um, have just really grasped after this idea of sin your heart out, you're under the grace, you're not under the law, blah, 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 and completely denied truth. They've, they, we've reached a time where men, have, men are rejecting sound doctrine. And they're chasing after teachers who tickle their ears and make them feel all good inside. But what they don't realize is that they're wretched, poor, and miserable, and they're dying in their sins. And uh, so we talk about this topic a lot. And uh, one of the things that's been itching at me or digging at me or that the Lord has been putting on my heart when I ask, why is this? And the thing that keeps coming across to me is there's no longer a fear of the Lord in the land. There's no longer a fear of the Lord in the land. And when you no longer have a fear of the Lord in the land, you have no wisdom in the land. And we all know where, no, where a lack of wisdom leads us right into destruction. And, uh, you know, Proverbs, and this is one that you've heard many, many, many times, but we're just going to read it again. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Notice that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you don't have the fear of the Lord, you haven't even begun to have understanding. You have zero understanding, especially about the things of God, if the fear of the Lord is not in you. And this isn't like a fear of the Lord, like, ooh, I just kind of respect you, you know, but, you know, we're still going to high five. No, no. This is a fear of the Lord. And that's the beginning of knowledge. But a fool despises wisdom and instruction. Job 28, 28 says, and to a man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, 
and to depart from evil is understanding. You see, having a fear of the Lord is wisdom, and departing from evil is understanding. You see, when you have a fear of the Lord, you depart from evil. If you don't have a fear of the Lord, you continue towards evil in your sin, and you make little happy excuses, and you say to yourself, oh, this is okay, I'm under grace, I can do what I want, Um, I'm free, the freedom of the gospel, you know, they're pleading the freedom of the gospel to continue on sinning, and and they like to take some quotes from Paul and take them out of context and make that their excuse to continue living in their sin, to continue watching that thing, to continue participating in that relationship. There's no fear of the Lord. You see, they have no wisdom. They have no understanding. Because if they had wisdom and fear of the Lord, they'd be departing from their evil, according to Scripture. You see, when you have an, an actual, and this is how you, you know, the fruits show whether or not you have the relationship, Right? Because when you have a meeting with God, when you have that interruption in your life and you truly see who God is and have an understanding of who God is and the truth pours in you, you have a fear that comes into you because you understand who you're dealing with. The best example of this, I think, is in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Let me just read this to you real quickly. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So here's Isaiah. Suddenly he's in a vision or in the spirit, and he's in the throne room of God. And these angels are flying around, and they give a description. You have to understand in the language at this time, the more times you said something, more uh, power was behind it. If you said something twice, you know, Christ would sometimes say, truly, truly, I say to you, which meant, pay attention. Notice the angels don't say it twice, but they say it three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Is God different today than he was yesterday? No, he's still holy, holy, holy. Now listen to Isaiah. And I would argue that Isaiah was probably a lot more righteous than I am, and that many of us are. Yet when he saw God, this was his response. So I said, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. You see, when Isaiah saw God and realized who God was, Isaiah realized who Isaiah was, a sinful man, because none of us are without sin, right? And when he realized who God was, he realized who he was, and he said, he pronounces a curse over himself. He says, woe is me, I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And not only that, I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. So even if I didn't have unclean lips, I live amongst people who do. I can relate to that. I can relate to that. I live in a culture that's murdered 55 million babies. I live in a culture where our Hollywood stars are worshipped instead of God, and they go on stage and they perform satanic rituals, and everybody applauds it. I live in a culture where people go up and they blaspheme the name of God on the podium and pronounce some feel-good garbage message that has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christ. They pervert the grace of God and teach people lies. So I relate to Isaiah when he says, I live and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. So Isaiah sees who God is. He realizes who he is and he says, woe is me. He understands that he's, he's undone. The words he uses is, I'm undone. You see, when we have the fear of Lord, when we understand who God is, we have the fear of the Lord. And then 
once we have that understanding, we have that wisdom, we get on our face and we say, oh, I'm undone, then God's mercy comes in. God's grace comes in. Then God's grace comes in. Then God's forgiveness comes in. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. See, Isaiah sees who God is. He has an understanding. He says, woe is me. I'm undone. He gets on his face before the Lord. Then the Lord forgives him of his sins. And then what's the next thing that happens? You have this whole conversion taking place here. Notice that Isaiah didn't do anything special other than realize who God was. And then God showed him mercy, forgave him his sins. And look at the next thing that takes place in the conversion. This should, all, this should take place in all of us. We hear the truth of God and the spirit confirms it in us and we, and we believe. And then we get filled with the Holy Spirit and we realize who we are and we beg for forgiveness. We repent of our sins and God's mercy falls upon us and we're forgiven. And then the next step that happens, God says, verse eight, also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then what's Isaiah do? He says, then I said, here I am, send me. You see how that works? When we understand who God is, the fear of the Lord comes in us. And then we have some wisdom. We repent. Then God's mercy and grace falls upon us. We can be covered with the blood, our sin taken away. And then we're all raising our hands saying, here I am, Lord, send me. That's what it looks like. But everybody wants to preach grace, grace, grace. I went to a Christian concert uh, on Thursday and it was a great time, a lot of fun some music there that I really enjoyed, some good worship music, also some music there that I can't believe is called Christian music, but it is apparently in this culture. And so it was kind of a mix of uh, being uncomfortable at times and, and really rejoicing at times. But there was one message, and I'm sure you can guess what it is, is it was, there was nothing about, you know, there was a little bit of preaching and message in between. Overall, I had a good time and I enjoyed it and I would recommend going. But there was little bits and pieces where it was just grace this, grace that, no message about repentance, no understanding about what it means to fear the Lord, no understanding about what it means to come to Jesus and bear that cross and deny ourselves and turn away from our our former life. That message is nowhere to be found, at least not in the United States of America. Everybody wants to quote Paul. Well, Paul makes it sound like, and then they don't give an example of what the scripture says other than maybe one line taken out of context. So I thought I would read Romans chapter six a little bit today. By the way, guys, this is how this works. I get up in the morning, I read, I pray, I ask the Lord to speak through me. I sit down at my computer and sometimes it takes me five minutes. Sometimes it takes me an hour or more and I ponder on what to talk about and I ask God to speak through me. Rarely ever is this message prepped in advance. This is one of those days where I just said, God, let it happen. And that's why we're doing this instead of reading uh, from the book of Revelation today. But Romans chapter 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because that's what we're told, right? Oh, you're under grace. You're no no longer under law. Paul said, should we continue in sin so that grace might abound? Question mark. Certainly not. Listen to what else he says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore were buried with him through the baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, when you're saved, you become a new creation. Just like Isaiah there. He says, oh, I'm undone. Then his sins are forgiveness. And he raises his hand and he says, send me, Lord. Verse 5. 
For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Resurrection, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, alive to God in Christ our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your member as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You see, that's so taken out of context, but when you read the whole thing, you get a whole new story, don't you? Because what people want to read is this last sentence, for sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are no longer under the law, but under the gra- under grace. I hear that over and over and over, and I'm like, did you read the first 13 lines before it that said you should not be living in sin anymore, that because Christ lives in you, you should be free from the sin, meaning that you no longer are a slave to it. Knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead. You see, text without context is a pretext to make it mean whatever you want. And people do this, and they call themselves Christians, and they say, ooh, and they put that one verse on a coffee mug or on a, on a piece of paper, and they hang it in their office or on their mirror in the bathroom, and they go, ooh, I'm under the law, and not under, I'm not under the law anymore, I'm under grace, completely ignoring what that actually means, because it was all described for you 13 verses before that. Folks, you got to study the Bible. Don't be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Let's finish this out. What then? Verse 15. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave? You see what Paul's saying there? You're either a slave to Jesus or you're a slave to your sin. So what happens if I'm a slave to sin? Well, he goes on. Whether of sin leading to death. See that? If you're a slave to your sin which you shouldn't be anymore if Christ Jesus reigns in you. We just read that, right? Whether a sin leading to death or the opposite, obedience leading to righteousness. Hmm. Seems to me like Paul talks about righteousness and holiness and living under the victory of Jesus quite a bit but I thought this was supposed to tell me that I don't have to worry about doing anything anymore, that I can just live how I want. Verse 17, But God, be thanked that you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slave of what? Righteousness. You see, when Jesus really lives in you, when you really understand who God is, you no longer become a slave to that sin that used to draw you in every single day. You're able to reject that sin. You're able to rebuke Satan. And instead, you become a slave to righteousness. That's what you desire to chase after. Verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For you, just as you presented your members of slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now you present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? You see, he's pointing out, he's saying, you know those sins that you used to be a slave to now? Now you're ashamed of that if you really live in Jesus. For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and have becoming slaves of God, you have your fruit and holiness 
and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, grace. Yes, it's free. Yes, we can't earn it. But if, it you, if you really have it, if Christ is living in you, you're going to be a slave to righteousness. You're going to be a slave to righteousness and holiness. You're going to be practicing righteousness and holiness, not because you're trying to earn something, but because you can't help but chase after righteousness when you serve the king. You say, Sean, why do you spend so much time on this? Why, day in and day out, do you you utilize your resources and time to get behind the microphone and preach righteousness and holiness to an, to a nation that hates righteousness and holiness and truth. Why do you waste your time with that? And the answer is quite simply this. Number one, I feel led to do it. Number two, it brings me joy to speak truth. And it grieves me all the lies and deceit that's spewed, and I can't help but resist it. And number three, you know, I believe that the return of Christ is on the horizon, that the marriage supper is near, and I'm trying to help as many people as I can get their garments cleaned up so they can participate in that wedding supper. Because there's going to be a lot of Christians, according to Scripture, who are going to be left behind And not like in the Left Behind movie, I don't subscribe to that, but I do believe that there is a small remnant of people that Jesus is going to spare. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell us to pray and say, Lord, spare me this hour of trial. Lord, find me worthy to escape all the things coming upon this earth and to stand before the Son of Man. He wouldn't tell the uh, the, the church uh, in uh, the first few ver- or the first few chapters of Revelation, uh, Philadelphia, he wouldn't tell them, "I'm going to spare you this hour of trial." But tell the church before that, you're going into great tribulation. Clearly, there's a remnant of people. He wouldn't tell us this parable over and over and over. There's several versions of this of this marriage supper that's taking place, but some aren't invited in. You know, the, I'm going to finish with with one of these. We, I've talked about the parable of the wedding feast several times, uh, but I want to read to you the version that's found in Matthew 22. I'm trying to prepare you for this so that you're ready. But let me tell you what's taking place and why the message of fear the Lord needs to be preached, why righteousness and holiness needs to be preached, why people need to understand that when you have a relationship with Jesus, you become a new creation. Just like Paul says, you become something new. Old things are passed away. You're no longer a slave to that old sin, to that pornography that drew you in every day. You can resist it now. But there's so many Christians who aren't living in victory because they've been deceived. And they're, they're in love with this world. And they're not going to make it. Parable of the wedding feast, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. I'm just going to read the first part of it. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Now, when we read that on the surface, we say, there's no way I wouldn't be willing to come. Really? I know a lot of people who, who profess Jesus And they would say that too. Well, that's not talking about me because I'm willing to come. But then verses 4 through 6 describe them to a T. Verse 4, again, he sent out his servant saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen are fattened, cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. And as a watcher, and those of you who are also watchers, you understand this part because we're going out and we're saying, hey, the marriage is here. Come to the wedding. Now is the time. You're out of time. Get ready. Get ready. Jesus is coming back now. And then what do our fellow brothers in Christ seem to be doing? Verses 5 describes exactly what they are doing. But they made light of it and went their ways. 
but they made light of it and went their ways. How many times you say the return of Christ is soon. We are entering into the tribulation period. Things are about to get crazy. I hope that you're ready and people just blow it off. Change the subject. They make light of it. They go their own ways. It says one to his farm, one to one another to his business. You see, they're concerned about the things of this world. They say to themselves, well, I hope Jesus isn't coming back just yet. I mean, I want to go to heaven, but not today because, you know, I really, really want, to see, want this business to take off. I really, really, really want to see my child graduate. I really, really, really want to get married. I really, really want to do this. So they make light of the warnings that you're giving them. And it's some, it says some will even seize the servants. We're going to be seeing that soon. We see it in a lot of other countries. We haven't seen it here yet, but we're going to. And they treat them spitefully, even kill them. This is the times that we're living in, folks. And I do this with hopes. You know, I don't know any of you. All I know, all I can see is the statistics. I know there's several hundred of you, sometimes several thousand, depending on what the message is and what week it is that listen. And all I can do is just kind of pray and say, you know, God, I hope that those who are hearing this, first of all, I hope it's your word coming out of my mouth and not my own. Don't let it be my own because I am a sinful, wretched human being and I will mess it up. I will mess it up. I pray that your word's coming out of my mouth and not my own. And by the way, don't just listen to my words and, and take it as truth. Take it to the Bible. Confirm it with Scripture. Then take it to God. Take it to the Holy Spirit. Study these things for yourself and see if they are true. Be wise in this. Study the Scriptures daily and see if these things are so. Be wise about this. But I just pray, you know, that people will hear it and that many will fall on their face Many will repent, many will be saved, and many will be changed. And I love getting the email saying that, saying that that's taking place. Time is about up. Let's get these garments cleaned up. And no, you can't do it yourself. Go to Jesus. Get before God and ask Him to help you with all these things that you're struggling with. If you don't feel like you love Jesus enough, tell Him the truth and say, Help me. Give me the heart of David. If you're still struggling with that sin, and there's sin, sins that still tempt me on a regular basis, and I have to go back to God and say, this is still coming at me. Lord Jesus, shield me from these arrows. Take me under your wing and shield me from the enemy. Deliver me from the enemy. Am I because I'm trying to earn heaven? No, because I want to be in relationship with Jesus, and I don't want this other filth in the way. I want to pursue righteousness because I love God. Because I want to spend eternity with the Lord, not because I'm trying to earn something and I'm writing off a checklist. No, I'm trying to make myself, you know, I'm trying to present myself to Jesus, ask him to cleanse me, make me clean, and then I'm trying to live in that victory. Do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not, because I'm a messed up human being. So what do I do? I get back on my face and I repent. True repentance, true I'm sorry, and a true turning away from the sin and agreeing with God that it's wrong. Not, not trying to find some teacher to tell me that it's okay. Not trying to find some scripture I can take out of context to, to make it okay what I'm doing. And if I catch myself doing that, I repent of it immediately. I'm not an example for you guys. The reason why I give you my personal examples is so you can understand that I struggle too. Because some of you write me and you say, man, I wish I could be like you. No, you don't. You don't want to be like me. Trust me. You don't want to be like me. You want to be like Jesus. And trust me, I'm nothing like him. You, th you know, Isaiah says to himself, woe is me. I'm undone. I have unclean lips. I got a lot more that's unclean than that. It's by God's great mercy. It's by the blood of Jesus and his work on the cross. But because of what he did... Because of what he did for me, I want to live close to him, in close proximity to him, in relationship with him. I want to practice the things that he told me to do to the fullest, uh, the best of my ability. And I just pray that he allows me to do that. 
And I pray that his mercy be upon me because I need God's great mercy and his grace. And I'm definitely not going to get behind a microphone or go on stage and tell you that it's okay to chase after that sin when the Bible clearly says that that's not true. I hope that this message blessed you. It's not anything like I expected it to be, which is good because that means it's not just of me. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear what you think about it. Send me an email, sean at truthfed.com. I wouldn't spend too much time bothering with the comments on YouTube, uh, especially if you're a troll, because I just just don't care about that. Um, If you want to reach out to me, you can do it at sean at truthfed.com. Tell me what you think. Like I've said many times, you may not get an email back just depending on how backed up I am on emails, and I'm always backed up a little bit, uh, but I get to read them at the very least, and I love to hear your story. By the way, if you want me and the audience to pray for you, send me an email that says, pray for me in the title, tell me what you need, and I'll bring it up on the podcast, and we'll get some people praying for you. Number two, if you need a Bible, if you need the Word of God, send me an email, I need a Bible, Sean at truthfed.com with your address. Tell me a little bit about your story and I'll send you one. Okay? Because we're running out of time and you need to know the Word of God and you need to draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the show for today. Hope it blessed you. Peace and grace be with you. God bless.